Welcome back to session two of the first day of the conference. We are still the monetary policy transmission through the banking sector session with our uh, last paper. Uh, this is a very interesting paper with a broader historical perspective. The title is uh, Monetary Policy, Inflation and Crisis, Evidence from History and Administrative Data. And it will be presented by Dimitri Kushinov, Universitat Pompeu Fabra. All right, so thank you very much for the very nice introduction and thank you to the organizers for accepting our paper into the program. I'm very excited to be here. I hope I don't let down the standard with so many excellent papers today. Um, and you know, thank you for everyone for sticking it out for the last session. I hope you enjoy it. So the paper um, is uh, co-authored with uh, Gabriel Jimenez, Jose Luis Pedro and Bjorn Richter, who are colleagues at UPF, uh, the Bank of Spain and Imperial College. And in this paper, we look at the links between the path of monetary policy rate and the risk of banking crisis. So, and we do it using mostly historical data and also some administrative data for the recent crisis in Spain. Now, you know, I thought it was interesting to have the presentation before because even though we use a very different uh, data source uh, to LARA, I think our conclusions are actually kind of aligned in, in that we also find this increased stress in the banking system if you raise rates after you cut them and then kept them low for a long time. So I think these two papers fit each other very nicely. So the reason we started looking uh, at this uh, project in the first place is that for the last few years, we've been in an environment of high inflation and rising monetary policy rates. And obviously, monetary policy makers need to get it right, need to balance various kinds of trade-offs and risk. The one kind of trade-off we know quite a lot about is the trade-off between um, taming inflation and triggering the recession. But there is also, there are also other very important kinds of trade-offs. Uh, maybe the main one of them is that raising rates can trigger a financial crisis, especially if in the previous period, that's why I connect to the previous presentation, you've kept the rates low for a long time. And indeed, over the last couple of years, we saw many kind of financial distress events, both in the banking sector and in different financial markets around the world. And we also saw policymakers and academics getting concerned about raising rates um, from, from a low level. So, but that being said, empirically, um, we kind of know relatively little, at least less than about these other types of trade-offs, about the links between the path of monetary policy rates and the risk of banking crisis. So when we started looking at this question uh, already more than two years ago, we thought that there might be something there. Because if you look at the uh, kind of case studies of important banking crises in the past, you see a, a quite consistent path of monetary policy rates. So here we have the Barings crisis from 1890 in the UK, the Great Depression, the um, Scandinavian and Japanese crisis of 1990s, global financial crisis. Um, and in all these crises, you have the same kind of monetary policy rate path. So first you cut rates, then you keep them low for a while, then you raise, and then you get a crisis. So this made us think, OK, let's explore a little bit this relationship between this path of monetary policy uh, and crisis risk. Uh, and this is exactly what we do in the paper. So we, first of all, um, ask a question of, OK, conditional on the crisis, do you observe this U-shaped path that you saw in the case studies? Then, OK, that's the first question. Then the second, conditional on a U-shaped path, so cutting rates, keeping them low, and then raising, are you more likely to observe a crisis? And then if the answer to both of these questions is yes, what are the underlying mechanisms in play? It's an empirical paper, and we use a two-pronged approach in the data. So most of our analysis, uh, our results on the crisis risk and on the mechanisms come from a long-run panel of historical crises, which goes back to 1870 for 17 countries, covering around 80 systemic crisis episodes. And then we also um, apply our methodology to a case study using detailed credit registry data for Spain. Uh, around the global financial crisis, which allows us to see what kind of loans, what kind of firms and banks are more effective during, during this kind of dynamics. Now, the two key variables for our analysis are the crisis and the monetary policy rate. Uh, crisis definition is standard kind of narrative of distress in the banking system. For monetary policy rates, we use uh, the short-term nominal interest rate, either just you know whatever rate the central bank sets, or the rate residualized to macroeconomic dynamics, GDP and inflation, or this international finance trilemma instrument. So the idea is for the instrument is that if you are Spain and you pack to Germany, when the Germany raises rates, you have to raise rates just to follow them. 
That's the idea behind the idea. All right, so that's what we do. All right, what do we find? So first of all, we do find indeed that a U-shaped monetary policy rate path increases crisis risk. Conditional on a crisis, you are very, very likely to observe a U-shaped rate path before. That's the first point. Then the second point, the other way around, if you have a U-shaped path, in particular, if you raise rates after a period where you cut them for a long time, then you are much more likely to get a crisis. If you raise rates not after a period where you've been cutting them over a long period, you are not more likely to get a crisis. So the U-shape is really key. Uh, this is different for non-crisis recessions. There we don't observe any of these U-shaped effects. And it's also stronger for a deeper U-shape. So you know, the more you cut rates before and the more you raise them after, the more likely it is that you will get a crisis. Now, in terms of the mechanisms we link these um, U-shaped monetary policy rates to a financial boom and bust, and we find that it's the combination of the two that is crucial. So what we find is that, first of all, when you cut rates, you're very likely to have a financial boom. So financial boom, we use a definition from a recent journal of finance of Greenwood et al., where you have very high asset price and credit growth at the same time. Okay, so you cut rates, you have a financial boom, and then after a financial boom, you quite often have a crisis, but we show that this only happens if you raise rates in the boom. Right, so if you raise rates in the boom, you have a crisis. If you don't raise in the boom, relatively much less likely to have a crisis. So it's the combination of this U-shaped monetary policy and this financial red zone or financial boom that is crucial. So the key thing is that you cut rates, you enter a boom, then you raise rates, and then you get a crisis. Then we explore some more detail on the mechanisms. In our macro panel data, we show that there is a boom bust in bank performance. So first, banks doing very well, you know, making a lot of profit uh, during the boom. Then when you raise rates, they're suddenly making large losses. Um, the returns on bank equity is very low, and so on. And then we're able to look at micro data. You know, we find similar results, but in micro data, we can test for which banks and for what kind of loans is this distress strongest. And that we find that this distress in the form of loan defaults is higher after U-shaped monetary policy, and it's especially high for ex-ante riskier firms and banks. All right, let me now go through one by one these results of the paper. So starting with the link between the path of monetary policy rates and future crisis. So in terms of the data, we're going to need a large historical sample because we want to document facts for an average crisis. So we use the standard data source in literature which is uh, from the Joda Schroelich Taylor database, 17 advanced economies, and of Europe, US, Canada, Australia, Japan, going back 150 years, which gives us about 70 to 80 crises. The crisis is defined based on a narrative of bank runs, defaults, or forced mergers in the banking sector. Against standard definition, our results also hold an alternative definition, which is not based on a narrative, but based on sharp declines in bank stock returns on market data. Then the second key variable is the monetary policy rate. So for this, we use the short-term interest rate, which is when we have it, the rates set by the central bank, but sometimes in history, it's not always clear what is, which rate the central bank sets. So we also use interbank rates and rates on short-term treasury securities. Okay, so now we have this data, we have the short-term rates, and we have the crisis defined as in the previous slide. We can see what's the path of monetary policy rates before or around an average crisis. Here we condition on a crisis in period zero, and then we just plot the average level of this monetary policy rate. You know, this is 6% going down to 5% and then raising again over seven years before and seven years after a crisis. And we see that this U-shape is not something that just happens in the case studies. It's something that happens before an average crisis. So you see a U-shape for a crisis on average, a stronger U-shape for a deeper crisis, and then a stronger U-shape again after World War II, especially for deep crisis. But then, you know, this is the average path. It could still be very noisy. It could have some large standard errors. So the next thing we do is we're trying to put some confidence band around this path. So what we do for the confidence band is very simple. We just uh, regress the change in monetary policy rates. This R, um, horizon H, T plus H minus horizon T. So from seven years before to seven years after the crisis on a dummy equal in again at year zero of the crisis with some country and decade fixed effects. So it's exactly as before, it, only now we have a standard error around this path and it's normalized to zero at the time of the crisis. Again, we see a U-shape for different um, types of crisis is quite, with quite narrow standard errors. So the next thing we did is to think, okay, it's something that happens before a crisis, but does it happen before any kind of um, 
bad macroeconomic event. So as well as crisis, we started looking at non-financial recessions. So as a recession, we don't have a banking crisis in the vicinity. And then we run the same kind of regression, but now the dummy is not for a crisis, but it's for a recession in this time zero line, and the scale is as on the graph before. So we see two things. So first of all, for a non-financial recession, the movements and rates are much less pronounced. So these things are much more flat relative to previous slide. And the second, most importantly, you do not observe a U-shape. So instead of a decline, low level, and an increase, you just observe some kind of normal level and then a hike before the recession. So it's all about rate hikes, not this U-shape of cutting and then hiking. Now, as a final way of summarizing these things, we can look at the statistical frequency of different monetary policy rate paths before a crisis or a recession. Okay, so what we do here is, first of all, we classify the different paths of monetary policy rate. So first of all, we have a U-shape. What is a U-shape? It's over a period of eight years, you cut rates for the first five years, and then you raise rates for the next three years. That's the U-shape. Then you can be raising for all of eight years. That's the second shape. You can have a lambda where you're first raising and then cutting, or you can be cutting throughout. And then we say, okay, you condition on a banking crisis today, and over the previous eight years, how likely you are to observe a U-shape. So 55% of crisis were preceded by U-shape. Every single deep banking crisis, so deep means economically bad for GDP, so every single deep crisis after World War II was preceded by U-shape in monetary policy rates. Uh, and these, different, these frequencies are much higher than what you'd observe on average, which is about 25% for each of the four shapes. Then we do the same thing for non-financial recessions. And here we see that the frequency of the U-shape is close to 30% and generally not statistically higher than the unconditional frequency. So before a non-financial recession, you're not that much more likely to observe a U-shape than unconditionally. So again, this U-shape is something specific to banking crisis. All right. So the next thing we do is now we start to look forward. This is conditional on crisis or recession looking back. Then we do conditional on shape looking forward. So here again, we have the four shapes over an eight year period. U-shape, raise, 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 cut, cut, cut. And then we say, okay, after these eight years, you observe a shape, what is the crisis probability in the next three years? After a U-shape of the next three years, there's roughly 20% probability of having a systemic banking crisis. Um, it's also there for deep crisis, for after World War II crisis and so on. It's much higher than the unconditional probability, roughly double, and it's much higher than the probability of the other shapes, and they are statistically different, right? So basically, after a U-shape, you're much more likely to observe a banking crisis than other monetary policy shapes. Um, yeah. It's robust to different crisis definitions, windows, and things like this. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to put this kind of um, shape specification in a regression and put some controls and see you know, if it really holds in a more kind of strict econometric setting. So this is what we do. Um, we put things into regression. And then one thing we need for the regression is an instrument to look at relatively more exogenous changes in monetary policy rate. So it's a fairly standard by now instrument in this kind of historical literature, especially is the based on the trilemma of monetary policy. And the idea is, is that if you have a fixed exchange rate regime, you are forced to follow under open capital markets the country that you peg into. Going back to Mandel, uh, and the way we implement it is, you know, a similar to these other papers which have done this kind of specification before, is we say, okay, suppose you're Spain peg into Germany, then you have the rate in Germany, residualized to economic conditions in Germany, you have to be pegged to Germany and have open capital markets, and then you can use this residualized German rate as an instrument for the interest rate changes in Spain. So let's see what happens once we put these things into a regression. Okay. So the way we do this is that we have on the left a crisis dummy. So it's a dummy which takes variable one if there's a crisis in the next three years. On the right, we have the percentage point change in rates. So that's kind of the last leg of the U, the raises. Then we have the cut over years T minus eight to T minus three. That's the first leg of the U, the cut in rates, and the interaction, which is really the U shape. So the interaction tells us if you raise rates after cutting, it's much worse for crisis risk. What do we get? Uh, in the full sample of crisis, we have that, first of all, that increasing rates increases crisis risk. That's kind of in line with previous studies. But then, once we put all of the three terms, we can see that this is the interaction. 
of the cut dummy for cutting rates before and then increasing rates that is important for the risk of crisis. So for example, focusing on this IV column four, we see that on the own, increasing rates without previous cuts do not really predict crisis. But then if you cut rates before, every single percentage points of higher rates brings up crisis probability by seven percentage points, which is quite large given that the average probability is like 10 percentage points. Um, so yeah. We have these large combined effects, and what, happens, what matters is the U-shape, this interaction in raising rates after you've cut them previously. Similar results a little bit stronger after World War II, uh, when monetary policy was perhaps a little bit more active in managing the macroeconomy. Uh, again, these results are robust to various checks, like a different crisis definition, excluding global financial crisis, running different kinds of specifications um, and models. So now we have shown that when you raise rates after cutting them, it increases the risk of banking crisis. The next thing we want to do is to see if we again observe the same for non-financial recessions. So on this slide, you have the same regression, but on the left, instead of a dummy for crisis, you have a dummy for a non-financial recession, so a recession which is not also a crisis, or a recession which is a deep recession, but is not also a crisis. Okay, we know that raising rates increases, makes the recession more likely. This is, you know, what we knew before, the top row. But you do not observe this interaction term. So raising rates after cutting them does not make a recession more likely than raising rates after raising them. There are no U-shape effects. The last thing we do in this section on U-shapes and crisis risks before we go to the mechanism is to try and see, you know, do different kinds of U-shapes lead to different types of crisis probabilities? So what we do, we look at two waves of looking at whether this U-shape is kind of deep or strong. The first way is just look at larger cuts in raises. So we see, okay, the more you cut rates and then the more you raise them, just in percentage point terms, the more likely you are to have a crisis. You know, it's kind of what you would expect, but it's also you know, interesting that you know, there are kind of, um, there's a continuous nature to this result. The second thing is that, okay, does cutting and then raising rates too much increase crisis risk? Okay, too much relative to what? What we do is we look at whether you cut more than your normal monetary policy rate reaction function to GDP growth and inflation. And we estimate this re reaction function by country and time period, um, referring to different monetary policy regimes. And we try and see, okay, if you cut rates by, no, by more than you normally would as a central bank, given observed GDP growth and inflation, and then you raise them by more than you normally would, given observed GDP and inflation, are you more likely to have a crisis? And the short answer to that question is yes. So here is again a frequency table, and here we split the U-shapes into two parts. The first one we call a strong U, where you cut rates by more than you normally would, given observed GDP and inflation. And then the second one, when you raise by more than you normally would. And you have a 30 percentage points, 30 higher uh, crisis, 30 percent crisis probability after this strong U shape. Now, if you instead cut and raise rates more or less in line with your normal reaction function, the crisis probability is not that high, kind of fairly similar to the other shapes or to the unconditional probability. So this cutting rates and then raising them by more seems to really matter for crisis risk. Now, we have shown that U-shaped monetary policy increases the risk of banking crisis, and this, this becomes stronger the stronger the U-shape. And it's something specific to banking crisis. So the next thing we do is we look at the mechanisms. Right. So what are the mechanisms? Okay, it's something related to banking crisis. We have a very large literature on mechanisms of banking crisis, typically talking about financial booms. So the, the idea here is that, okay, how can this monetary policy U-shape be, be tied to these financial vulnerabilities? And the idea is that, okay, when you first cut rates, you can create financial vulnerabilities. And then afterwards, when you raise rates, when the vulnerabilities are there, you will trigger a crisis. Now we define financial vulnerabilities. We don't define it ourselves. We just want to take an off-the-shelf definition. We take the, one of the more recent papers, which is well published, is Greenwood, Hansen, Schleifer, and Sorensen, and they define these vulnerabilities as the red zone. So when you observe a very high credit growth, top um, quintile, and a top tertile of asset price growth together, then you are in a so-called red zone. Right? So that's when you have a financial boom, large growth in credit and asset prices. So then the first thing we do is we say, okay, 
does cutting rates make a financial boom, this red zone, more likely? The answer is yes. So what we do here is we have the next three years this red zone indicator on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have the change in rate. So this is, you know, for every percentage point of cut, you're two percentage points more likely to end up in the red zone. Five percentage points for the IV. This is a cut dummy. Again, when you cut rates as a dummy, you're more likely to end up in the red zone. And also, if you cut rates by a lot, again, financial boom is more likely. Now, in kind of the last few months, we're also trying to understand a little bit more like, what exactly is going on in the boom. And what we observe in this boom are kind of the following things. We observe low credit spreads, high valuations of bank equities, and then at the same time of these low spreads and high valuations, predictably worse outcomes. So predictably worse credit outcomes, predictably low future bank stock returns, which suggests there might be these channels of increasing credit supply and over optimism in play in line with some previous studies of credit booms. So, and these are connected indeed to this um, loose monetary policy. So then, okay, the next step, so say you, you've cut rates, you've created a financial boom, or there is a financial boom after cutting rates, um, and then what happens when you raise rates in a boom? Okay, so here, this table shows that when you raise rates uh, in this red zone, you're much more likely to have a crisis. So the dependent variable on the left is again a crisis dummy, and on the right we again have increasing rates, and then this financial boom, red zone indicator, and the interaction. So the interaction will tell us if raising rates in the boom is especially bad for crisis. So we have the previous result from many previous studies that you know, these financial booms are associated with higher crisis risk, but then we show that, okay, once you look at raises in a boom, then only if you raise in the boom, when you have this interaction, only then you truly get the higher risk of crisis. So it's really a financial boom without raising doesn't give you that much higher crisis risk. Uh, and it's especially true for these residual raises when you raise more than you normally would, given your normal reaction function to GDP and inflation. Interestingly, we only observe this kind of you know, interaction of raising rates in the boom predicting crisis for those red zones where you cut rates before. So if you were raising rates before entering the boom, the red zone, then it doesn't seem to predict crisis very well. So from this we conclude preliminarily that the interaction of this U-shaped monetary policy and this red zone, financial boom, is really crucial for crisis. And then I think we have a quite a nice way of showing that this interaction is crucial through again the following frequency table. Now again, this is the frequency of crisis over the next three years. So it's the same as before. But now we don't sort things by shape, we sort them by combinations of U-shaped monetary policy and red zone. Okay, so the combination is here is when you observe both U-shaped monetary policy and red zone over the previous eight years. Um, then you can have U-shaped monetary policy without red zone, red zone without U-shaped monetary policy or neither. And then we can see that the crisis observations are really concentrated in this top category. So this is the crisis frequency, and this is the, you know, the number of observations where we have both U-shaped monetary policy and red zone and number of crises. And we see that the crisis frequency is almost 40%. And then when you have either just a red zone or just U-shaped monetary policy, it's much lower. So it's really the combination of these two things that matters. For example, after World War II, we had 71 red zones, 71 financial booms. Only one of them ended up in crisis. So these are red zones, sorry, 71 red zones without U-shaped monetary policy, right? We had only 33 red zones where you also had U-shaped monetary policy, but then 10 crises. So it's really the combination of the two that is key. And then the last thing we're doing is mechanism section is we try to understand, okay, well, the combination seems to be key. It's kind of different to the previous, you know, literature on crisis. We just looked at the credit booms. So, so why is it that the combination is so important? And we look at two things. So the first idea is that, okay, when you raise rates in the boom, it somehow reverses these vulnerabilities that built up during the low rate period. So what we do is we see, okay, let's see, for example, let's just look at how much was the historic, the past increase in house prices last few years, and then, okay, does raising rates after, when house prices increase by a lot, does it trigger an especially large decline in house prices? That's the first thing we do. And the second thing is that, okay, there might be, like in the previous presentation by Lara, some vulnerabilities in the banking system during this low rate period. So then we see, okay, does raising rates, does it have some kind of 
uh, does it lead to some bad outcomes for the banking sector? So let me show you uh, briefly both of these things. So the first one is this vulnerability. Okay, so what this shows, we run this regression. So why is, yeah, let's just look at this. I think it's easier to explain with house prices. So why is just the change in house prices? And then we have some country in decade fixed effects. And then this one is the standard thing. Okay, you raise rates, you normally get lower house prices. This we know. Then this is just an indicator for high house price growth over the past three years. RZ is the red zone threshold, so it's like the top quintile of house, sorry, the top tercile of house price growth. Well, okay, when, when you have past house price growth, you also, might also observe some mean reversion later. And here is the interaction. Does raising rates when ha past house price growth is, was already high trigger an especially strong decline in house prices? And we see indeed this is the case. So this is the interaction coefficient when you raise rates, given a high previous vulnerability, you trigger an especially strong reversal in this vulnerability. It's also true for household credit, business credit, stock prices, uh, also true when we do uh, this with an instrument instead of the raw changes in rates. So that's the first thing. Raising rates triggers the reversal in vulnerabilities. The second thing is these effects on the banking sector. So here we run the same regression almost that we were running for crisis. Like we had the change in rates then the cut rate dummy for like the first leg of the U-shape and this U-shape interaction, right? Which is like when you raise rates after cutting them, you, something bad happens, more or less. Now the bad thing happening now is not a crisis dummy, but a variables related to profitability of the banking sector. So we have a return on equity, the uh, change in the MPLs relative to loans, and then the market return on bank equity. And indeed we see these U-shaped effects that when you increase rates, um, after cutting them, this leads to this kind of bad outcome, uh, declines in ROE, increases in MPLs, and declines in market returns on bank stocks. So the last thing we do is we say, right, we observe um, some negative effects of this U-shaped monetary policy on the banking sector, and you know, in general, some effects on crisis. And now we want to drill down in a bit more detail what's going on at the loan level. Because in the macro data, we cannot really look at heterogeneities, but different types of loans, different types of firms, and so on. So what we do is we go to the credit register in Spain um, around the global financial crisis, and then we say, OK, the, we try and kind of reproduce something that is close to the regression that we had before in the macro data. So now the variable on the left, instead of the crisis indicator, is a loan level variable for the loan defaulting. Then on the right-hand side, we have the change in interest rates over three years, the dummy whether the rates were previously cut, the interaction of the two. That's what we had before in the macro data. But then what we can do in macro data, we can interact them with firm and bank characteristics. So we can see if these effects, if loan defaults increase more after U-shaped monetary policy, that's the interaction. If they increase more by, by for some types of loans to some types of firm, to some type of bank. We think it's kind of a nice laboratory to study this question because Spain during this period had a relatively exogenous monetary policy set in Frankfurt, targeting more the euro area countries. It was not really case, the case after 2008 with the Spanish sovereign debt crisis and so on. That's why we cut our sample there. And then this regression allows us to say what types of loans default more after U-shaped monetary policy for the case of the global financial crisis in Spain. Okay, so it's a, it's a big table. I hope you can see it from the back row because you know now we have the micro data. We have a million observations, and we can throw in you know, all kinds of fixed effects and things like this. Uh, so the, the first three rows are just replicating what I showed you before in the macro data. So um, when you uh, cut rates and then you raise them, you observe especially high defaults on an average loan. And then these interaction terms, they show you that these defaults are higher for ex ante risk care firms, which you know for the real estate boom in Spain, it was definitely the real estate firms also firms which find it costly to get credit, and for relatively ex ante riskier banks. So for example, banks with high non-performing loan ratios, and this uh, quadruple interaction for ex ante riskier banks lending to ex ante riskier firms here. Uh, the effects are kind of reasonably large, so you know, a doubling maybe of, of, of loan default rates uh, after a U-shape, and then another kind of 50% or 30% increase for some of these categories. So, you know, let me in the last minute conclude what we have done. So uh, I've shown you that a U-shaped monetary policy rate path increases crisis risk. And in particular, raising rates increases crisis risk 
but only if rates were previously cut over a long period. This link is something unique to banking crisis. It's not there uh, for non-crisis recessions, and it's stronger the deeper this U-shape in monetary policy rates. Then when we look at the mechanisms, is this combination of a U-shape in monetary policy rates and this red zone, the financial boom, that's crucial. So what you really need is kind of three things to happen. You need to observe a cut in rates, then a financial boom, and then a hike during the boom, and then you're very likely to have a crisis. And we show that the banking sector seems to be affected by this, seems to be important to the transmission. Moreover, when we go in micro data for the Spanish case study, we observe stronger effects for ex-ante worst firms in banks. Now we think, okay, I'm almost out of time, but just last 15 seconds, on, I think it's interesting to think about policy implications. So first of all, I guess when central banks change interest rates, the effects on financial stability might depend on the previous decisions in interest rate, previous monetary policy. And then, you know, sometimes central banks need to raise rates, like over the last couple of years, clearly to target inflation. So, you know, can we learn something? I think we can learn a few things. So first of all, you know, maybe if you have an opportunity to raise rates before entering the financial boom, or while not a financial boom, this is much less dangerous for financial stability. Uh, also, perhaps raising rates, but not raising them by more than you normally would, seems to also uh, alleviate some of the crisis risk. Or perhaps if you really have to raise rates quickly and by a lot, then you could look into using other policies like macroprudential policy to alleviate, alleviate the financial stability concerns. Uh, thanks very much for listening. I very much look forward to your comments and discussion by Christina. Thank you, Dimitri. And the discussion will be given by Christina Manea from the Bank of International Settlement. Thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper, which I think will certainly remain a reference in the empirical literature on monetary policy and financial stability. And thank you, Dimitri, and also to your co-authors for engaging in such a policy-relevant um, project. So this is an empirical paper uh, where the authors, they point out that the U-shape path of monetary policy uh, creates uh, financial instability. And uh, to make this point, they use both uh, macroeconomic data as well as uh, micro, da mac micro uh, data. Uh, regarding the macro data, they use uh, the Jorda, Shularik, and Taylor uh, macro history databases, and they show that um, this, uh, that crises, they tend to be preceded by this U-shaped path of monetary policy. So this uh, very long, um, very low interest rate, um, which stay long for a long period of time, and then they, are, they abruptly uh, increase. And in, um, in the paper, they point out that these systematic pat patterns, despite being observed for nominal interest rates, they are not observed for inflation or real interest rates. And then they look into the, the mechanisms, and um, they point out that these uh, low interest rates, they make, um, the, uh, make more likely that, they, uh, that the economy enters a financial fragile zone, like the red zone, where um, asset prices and credit uh, are high. And that, uh, the and that tightening on, on, on the heels of that boom will crystallize financial uh, fragilities and will increase um, even more the probability of a crisis. And then from the micro data, they, uh, find, they go to the case of, um, of Spain be um, before the great financial crisis in 2000. Eight, and they point out that the loans uh, that they were given after a prolonged, long period of low interest rates, they were more likely to default, and uh, especially for risky firms or for risky banks, and that even more so if the tightening uh, occurred. Um, yeah, that. Um, so in. Um, so yeah. So I think. Uh, I like a lot the paper. It's also because, um, I will, together with my co-authors, uh, Frédéric Boisset from the Bank for International Settlements, Fabrice Collar from Toulouse, Toulouse School of Economics, and Jordi Gali from the Research Center for International Economics uh, in Barcelona, we have a theoretical framework uh, where uh, all these empirical facts, they can be rationalized. So, yeah, so uh, what I will do to, uh, today, I will, try to, um, try, I will try to tell a story of this empirical uh, fact through the lens of this um, theoretical model on monetary policy and endogenous financial crisis. So in particular, I will first uh, talk about the origin of this U-shape and also about the way monetary policy uh, um, nourishes financial instability. 
And I will point out that this uh, U-shape of monetary policy can be um, triggered by monetary policy by itself. So what we know too low for too long, so unexpected uh, John Taylor's great deviation hypothesis. So it is because uh, monetary, policy, monetary policy stays too loose for a long period of time and then uh, tightens abruptly. So this is one um, instance where this U-shape can occur. But I will also talk about uh, um, another case where uh, mon um, this U-shape appears because of a systematic response of monetary policy to uh, business cycle shocks, and in particular to um, um, positive supply shocks. So you have a supply boom, and because of this uh, supply expansion, uh, you will have these disinflationary pressures, and the central bank comes and is going to uh, uh, cut rates to respond to this inflation. And by doing so, it will implicitly nourish financial instability. And then once this technology, technological boom recedes, uh, there will be a pickup in inflation, and then a central bank will tighten, and then we'll observe the other part of the U-shape. So uh, I will point out that this, uh, the contribution of monetary policy on this U-shape can be both discretionary, so this too low for too long, but it also can be systematic, the like response endogenous response to these supply-driven booms. And these two types of uh, U-shapes, they will explain why, even though uh, before crisis we have the systematic patterns of U-shape for nominal policy rates, we do not observe the same thing for real rates and inflation. So that is going to be the first part of my presentation. And then I will also talk about the normative implications of their results through the lens of our theoretical model. And in the end, I will just uh, discuss how one could use this model to think about financial stability risks at the current juncture in the euro area. So um, this U-shape can be what we are used to think of this too low for too long pattern. So monetary policy stay, stays unexpectedly low for a long period of time. And uh, like John Taylor's great deviation hypothesis, and because of that, it's going to feed a, a boom. And, uh, the, um, because of the, and then when it tightens, it will just crystallize this financial instability and will drive the economy into a, cri a crisis. We observed that before uh, the GFC, for instance. And we also can, uh, in, the, in our model, we get exactly the same thing. So, uh, yeah, by, keeping the, uh, by simulating the model of endogenous financial crisis, we can see that monetary policy can by itself trigger a crisis just by, ke by keeping the policy rate unexpectedly low for a long period of time, so like negative uh, um, monetary policy shocks, and then by um, tightening abruptly unexpectedly, so positive technology shocks. So we have that uh, also in the model, as uh, also in line with their uh, empirical um, results on the, on, from the micro side, it is because at the end of these booms, marginal productivity in the economy, uh, so after the tool for too long, is very low. So agents, they uh, tend to search for yield. And because of these agents' fee frictions, which, be, which become uh, more, uh, more, uh, more severe, um, they, they can, credit markets, they may collapse. So yeah, this is also in line with there. Uh, what is um, interesting about this uh, U-shape is that too low for too long, so unexpectedly lo uh, loose monetary policy, sh uh, you sh if this is the case, so this type of U-shape, we should necessarily observe it with inflation because unexpectedly low for too long monetary policy, it means that it's expansionary monetary policy, so it creates a demand boom. So if this is the case, we should observe that this U-shape, it's accompan accompanied with uh, inflation, so above target inflation. And this is the case for a lot of um, crises in, in their historical data set, and for instance, also for uh, what happened in Spain. So for Spain, before the GFC, we observe that uh, the policy rate, you have the U-shape in the nominal interest rate, and you observe that inflation was above target. So monetary policy at that time, it was expansionary. And again, the real rates, uh, they are negative. So one example of this U-shape, like a too low for too long, uh, it's Spain, or a lot, if you look at a lot of countries, Ireland, but a lot of them, um, before the GFC, uh, they were like this. So it was like monetary policy creating financial instability because of loose monetary policy. So if this is the case, this is something to remember. If it's too low for too long, then you observe nominal interest rate, you shape, but with inflation. And if we look uh, at uh, the case of the US, it's exactly the same thing. A bit of deflation, but again, the U-shape, it is with inflation. So the John Taylor Grace deviation hypothesis implying that in the US also, monetary policy contributed to the boom. 
So this is one type of U-shape. But there is also, so in this way, monetary policy affects financial stability by this, this discretionary contribution. But there, there is another possible uh, systematic way through which monetary policy can affect the probability of a crisis via this U-shape pattern. And this is, it happens also for a lot of uh, countries, if we look uh, country by country, because of a technological boom. So sometimes a lot of these um, crises in the past, the booms, they were supply driven. So you observe a, this, a high TFP growth before, and because of that, we have deflation, the central bank responds to deflation. Interest rates are very low. The, the boom recedes, the central uh, inflation type uh, picks up, the central bank responds. So this is another way with which monetary policy this way uh, affects the probability of a crisis via the u shape but in a systematic way. And uh, in order to identify this type of U-shape, the distinguishing feature is that it appears with deflation. So for instance, one example is uh, Jap the Japanese crisis, uh, which there is an empirical, uh, there, is a, uh, there, are, uh, there is evidence that uh, before this Japanese slump, there was a boom, technological boom driven by electronics like GVC and uh, Sony. So, and also if you look at TFP before the crisis, you have an increase in TFP. So in this case, we observe the policy rate was low, but we observe it with deflation. So this is one case through, um, where it was the systematic part, the U-shape was a response to a systematic uh, response of monetary policy. So, and a distinguishing feature of this type of U-shape is that it appears to be deflation. And if they, when they look in the post-World War II uh, sample, uh, uh, they can see that a lot of crises they are, you have, it's also U-shaped for deflation. So a lot of crises, apart from the GFC, in the post-World War II, they were driven by these uh, supply factors. And this is also why, uh, this also explains why um, we don't, uh, we, we, even if we have this U-shaped pattern for policy rate, we do not uh, observe the same thing for real rates or inflation, because the demand one, it, uh, the, the u shape in demand comes with uh, inflation above target. The u shape in, uh, with the systematic part, with the supply boom, it comes with deflation. So it depends on the sample. So there are these two types of, and also the real rate is the same. For the monetary one, real rates are negative and they're low. For the supply driven, because you have high productivity, real rates are high. So this explains why you can, this is a one way to rationalize why you can have a U-shape for nominal interest rate, but not for real rates and inflation. And just now to point out some normal simplifications, they point, uh, they, uh, in the paper they argue that um, one way, one policy implication is that you need to have preemptive action. It's also what we see through the lens of our model that uh, you should uh, try to systematically uh, tame the boom before to curb the boom just from the beginning, but in a systematic way, such that you don't get into an R zone or you get less frequently in the, in, uh, in the R zone. And we have, uh, yeah, we have this augmented Taylor rule where we also respond to this index of financial fragility, which is doing exactly that, is taming the boom, and then it de declines the probability of a financial crisis and also improves welfare. But there is another way, which is a direct way um, also coming from the uh, theoretical analysis, uh, uh, an implication is that monetary policy, we can see, we saw that can by itself create a crisis by keeping policy rates unexpectedly long, low and then rising them. So one impl direct implication is that the central bank could just avoid, if it's possible, to, uh, to conduct these too low for too long patterns. And uh, yeah, it's true that there are pegs or if in a euro area, if they can't do so, they should think that you, they should, um, um, come with other policy tools to correct imbalances. And just for, to, give, to talk about how can we use this um, uh, paper to think about financial stability risks today. So what they show is that by keeping, uh, you have these U-shaped patterns, you boost the credit, you boost credit and asset prices, you put the economy in the R zone, and then you tighten. So uh, the implication is that today we are in a tightening cycle, so for sure, while raising steeply the monetary policy rates, you, uh, central banks, they increase financial stability. But an important factor in their analysis for this risk, it's um, the boom before. So in order to assess the risks today, it's important to look whether there was a boom. So whether the economies, uh, the euro area economies, and the, indep uh, the indep uh, individual members, they were in an R zone before the, the crisis. And one thing which is very specific about this U-shape, which happened in the euro area today, is that the low for long, it 
part of it, it was a low for long at the zero rebound coming from uh, the euro area debt crisis. So that could be also like tight monetary policy. So they were at the zero rebound for a long period of time because of the debt crisis. And then there was another part of this too low for too long coming from the backstop, which happened in the face of COVID. So yeah, and then you, you had the tightening. So the low for long period, it was special this time. It was low for long at the zero rebound after the, um, the debt crisis, and then it, was, uh, uh, then it was a further loosening because, um, because of the COVID. So when they uh, loosened even more in order to backstop financial markets and to avoid the crisis. Now, if we look just at the level of the euro area, we can see that before so the first part of the low for long, there was no uh, boom in uh, credit to GDP. But this is at the level of the euro area. So it doesn't, just looking at, at crafts, there, there was no boom. There was just an increase in credit because of this um, low for long because of the backstop. So at the level of the euro area, the, the, as a whole, was not in an R zone. So only the, the tightening part poses risk to financial stability. But it's important uh, to look uh, the um, yeah, and now or the individual euro area uh, members. And I was discussing with someone in Ireland who were saying that uh, they might, they had a credit boom before. So it's, it would be interesting and now to look at each um, yeah, euro area member and to assess whether it was, uh, uh, it was in a red zone before and in order to assess financial stability risks and the individual level, um, individual country level, because we saw after the GFC that even if the things, they look well at the level of the Eurozone, if members, they may behave in a different way and this can have spillovers effects afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Dimitri, do you prefer to react uh, to Christina's now? I mean, me yeah, just briefly, I mean, to say thank you very much for a very nice uh, discussion. And, you, you know, I, I take on board all the points. Uh, just wanted to say that, you know, indeed, I think uh, Christina's theoretical paper is a great fit and a way for me to understand better our empirical results. You know, I had to skip the literature slide on the f for this presentation, but, you know, it is there. Uh, and we'll, you know, strengthen the links in the new version of the paper. Uh, and then, you know, it's yeah, very nice for understanding this optimal policy conduct, you know, ra raising before or not cutting too much and things like that. Um, and the, yeah, thanks again for the comments on inflation and real rates. It's true that we don't observe this U-shape in inflation uh, or real rates, at least not a stable one, which you know has puzzled us for a while. So we, we, I, I didn't really talk about it much today because we're still not sure if it's just measurement error or something else, but it looks like there could be some economics there. So we will definitely think about this more and do some more analysis. And yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, policymakers, I mean, I'd be interested to hear people's views because when we originally wrote the paper, we, we thought it looked quite dramatic, you know, in terms of this uh, U-shape and, and crisis risk. But then we do have this very important interaction with the red zone. So in a way, if you have a U-shape, but, but no red zone, it doesn't seem to be so bad for financial stability. And so far, perhaps, in the euro area and globally, we have observed some small uh, bank failures and some distress in individual markets, but not kind of a big systemic crisis. So yeah, I'm kind of hopeful, but yeah, I'll be interested to see what, what other people in the room think. Yes, let's open the floor for some questions. Over there. Yeah, my name is Doreen Rookmaker. I'm a member of the Econ Committee from the European Parliament. And I would like to invite the two of you to the Econ Committee on the next mandate. Because in the Econ Committee, I think 99% of the members are thinking that banking are the biggest source of financial risk and are the source for the financial crisis and banking crisis. And as you explained so eloquently, monetary policy is a big factor too. And uh, after the financial or banking crisis of 2008, banking got a lot of rules and regulations. We are busy with it every day in the Econ Committee. But the central banks, who are also a big factor, as you explained so eloquently, don't have any um, regulation whatsoever. And I think it's important for my colleagues in the Econ Committee to at least understand that this is, an, that it, that it is a factor. I am 
Thanks for the, for the invitation. I mean, I would say that the banking sector is really key. Um, you know, it's, um, if you don't have a boom in this kind of financial markets, the banking sector, then it doesn't matter too much uh, what the central bank does. And, and then in, in a sense, the banking crisis, you know, is happening at the bank level. So if you do make the banking sector more resilient, then, you know, regardless of these monetary policy actions, you might not, you will presumably be less likely to observe a crisis. Uh, take some more questions, perhaps. Yeah. Okay, um, my question is more prosaic. Um, so, uh, and Christina's great discussion kind of touched and was, I was wondering a little bit more what's behind the U. Um, just for example, you could have uh, autocorrelation in crisis, right? So every time you have a crisis, then you have to cut, and then you again, um, Christina, you mentioned the kind of TFP thing. I mean, if I'm thinking more small open economy, maybe commodity, which might well be reflected in TFP in some sort of measurement. But then it's maybe the exchange rate. It would maybe be interesting to plot something about the exchange rate as well. Um, then I'd, maybe your sample is not really small open commodity exporters, but I guess understanding a little bit more, and the theory paper does a lot of that, you know, what it, it, this is all endogenous, right? W what exactly is this you? Um, that's kind of where I'm trying to get at. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so it's not autocorrelation. Uh, so we actually checked if it's driven by these things where you have a crisis and then you cut. So the gaps between crisis are a bit too long for this. They're like 15 years. And then for us, it's pretty like the last eight. So, so it's not the autocorrelation. I will fight back against the endogeneity point. So you know, in a way, we, we residualize on macroeconomic conditions. We, we do have the IV. And we do find that this extra part is important. So you know, this uh, you above and beyond macroeconomic observables. And for example, when you respond to another country, which you are back to uh, raising race, it do seem to be very important for the results. Um. So certainly my understanding, my interpretation of the crisis in Spain and in the US is that the increase in inflation was not causal with regards to the banking crisis. This was a consequence of the fact that there was a bubble that was exploding. At some point, aggregate demand triggered inflation. The Fed responded to that. and you know, the, the bubble exploded regardless of what happened to monetary policy. I think monetary policy in my view was quite irrelevant for the story in Spain and the US in those, in those two cases. Certainly it's important to have controls over banks, but central banks should be independent. And, 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 I'm sorry, if you don't have the mic, we don't uh, yes. hear. So, so, so I think it's very important to keep the independence of central banks. That has been proven, has been understood. Yes, sometimes they make mistakes, but those mistakes are based on a mandate. They have some rules, okay? The rules are the mandate, and they follow those rules. We, if one thing we agree on probably in this room is that it's very important, the independence of central banks, and that politicians, both in Europe and in the US, for sure should be, stay away from central banks. So I agree that the independence of central banks is very important. And uh, we'll trust the central banks to, the the you know, take our findings and judge them and implement policy much more than other parties. And there is a we could talk about technical stuff as well if you want, but, you know, just to support the independence. There are two questions over there. Sorry. Yes, so uh, just to, to, to advertise... Uh, um, one, one analysis that uh, we did uh, recently uh, at the BIS in the quarterly uh, review in, uh, in, uh, that came out um, in, uh, in December, where basically, uh, you know, that's in the conclusion that you, that, that you presented, you know, the role of other policies. And we show that the macroprudential policies uh, reduce the likelihood that uh, when you increase interest rates, they would be, uh, uh, it would be followed by, by a financial crisis. So I think that there's been a learning from the, uh, fr from the great financial crisis and, and having more instruments in place, uh, you know, help uh, the authorities to, to, to rely on, on the Timbergen principle and, and, uh, and, and so lower the chances that this increase in interest rate, which may be warranted, uh, uh, for the price stability objective uh, would trigger, or at least reduce the likelihood that it may trigger uh, this, uh, this, this financial uh, cycle. But I, I think you wanted the, the microphone. Yes, I wanted the microphone because I do not want 
to do anything about the independency of the uh, uh, central banks, but I do want central banks to learn from crisis. That and and I I do want uh, people in the econ committee to understand the system, because the people in the econ committee in the European Parliament are deciding about rules and regulations that do have an impact on financial stability and financial risk. And if they do not understand the system well, then they probably make the wrong decisions. This is why I, I asked them to come and the lady to come, not because I want to influence the central banks. That is something I want uh, to correct. There is a final question over there. Basta, if you want to take it. <laughs> OK, OK. <laughs> no, and thanks for this point about MacroPro. I think indeed it's kind of interesting. I mean, uh, maybe you have the data. It will be interesting to see kind of the MacroPro responses in this hiking cycle versus some others uh, and to understand better how it's related to the financial stability stress because my sense is that it's an important factor. But unfortunately for me, in the historical data, we simply do not have a good enough data for this sample of MacroPro tools. But perhaps, yeah, reading your reports will inform me about the more recent ones. Okay, so if there are no additional questions, I'd like to thank uh, Cristina, Dimitri, the presenters and the discussant from earlier session and uh, the audience. With this paper, the first uh, day of the conference is closed. So thank you all and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>